This episode is sponsored by the Real Estate Foundation of BC. REFBC is a philanthropic organization that supports sustainable, equitable, and socially just relationships with land and water. Learn more about the foundation's grants and initiatives at refbc.com. My name is Keith Carlson, and I'm a Canada Research Chair at the University of the Fraser Valley. Uh, prior to that, I was 18 years as a faculty member at the University of Saskatchewan. And prior to that, I was 10 years as the historian and research coordinator at the Stala Tribal Council. Okay, amazing. I would really like to talk to you uh, to give you a bit of a background on myself. Mm -hmm. um, my mother was a part of the 60 Scoop, mm -hmm. and so she was raised in White Rock by uh, her, my non-biological grandmother, uh, Dorothy Kennett. Uh, she is my role model, part of the reason I started this. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the challenges I think my mom faces and that I face now is that um, I understand perhaps Christian belief systems, um, Catholic belief systems, deeper than I understand indigenous belief systems. Um, and I've had the opportunity to sit down with Eddie Gardner, mm. uh, Sonny McKelsey, and I'm trying to mm. uh, perhaps bring the two together, trying okay. to um, understand them. And I think that it's such a pleasure to sit down with you because you have a background uh, in the with the Catholic Church. Um, and I think you understand uh, that world. And you've had the opportunity to work for years with Sonny McKelsey. And I think that uh, it would be really interesting to get your perspective on what mm. that that relationship has been like for you? What have you um, seen? What have you experienced? How did you get started, perhaps, uh, with your faith? Yeah, good questions. Um, so when I was a kid, uh, so my, my, uh, my mother is Roman Catholic and my dad uh, was United Church of Canada. And, um, and so when my, they got married, the, my dad had to promise to raise us as Catholics. <laughs> and, uh, and so as a little kid, uh, I was baptized Catholic, um, and then I went to church with my mom on Sundays kind of thing. I remember as a little kid doing that. Then my mom had a falling out with the the priest, not so much the faith. She still had a rosary, you know, that she'd carry with her. She still, you know, was very Catholic. But the priest had told her at some point they disagreed about, I think, birth control, but also um, uh, the fact that my grandmother, my mom's mother, uh, had converted to um Protestantism when she married my great my grandfather, right? And so this was a sin, and the priest told my mom that she wouldn't, uh, my grandmother wouldn't go to heaven or something horrible like that. Wow. So my mom just sort of wrote that priest off and became sort of a home Catholic. And uh, so as a kid, though, I, I, I uh, my aunt, my mom's. My dad's mom, my dad's sorry, my dad's sister would pick me up and take me to Sunday school, uh, Protestant Sunday school on Sundays. And then the kids down the street, there's a family, a big family, twelve kids. Um, it was kind of a, a poor working class neighborhood, and um, they, they, that that family struggled a bit. Their dad was an alcoholic, and you know, um, and they, anyway, they went to the Salvation Army. So I thought, oh, that's cool. So I would, the bus would come by to pick them up, a little minibus on the on the Sunday, and I. I'd jump in with them and go to Sunday school at the Salvation Army. So, and then when I was thirteen or so, I um, I started having you know quite a questions like, what is the world? I saw that TV show or movie it was called um, based on that book, um, uh, the Gods something. The the idea that there were aliens that came down from space and, and gave people the knowledge to build the pyramids and things. I can't remember now what it was exactly. And I remember thinking, oh, well, this is sort of like a you know, crazy idea. And uh, my mom suggested that I, well, why don't you go down and talk to the priests? There were new priests in town by then. She still wasn't going to mass regularly on Sunday or anything. And I went down and, and hung hung out with these priests for a couple, you know, Sunday or Saturday afternoon kind of things at the rectory. And they were just really friendly. And uh, and I just asked them all these questions I had about faith and what was the world and how did things work. And, um, and then I went um, back and uh, they suggested I or invited me to go to um, uh, catechism. Um, lots of pretty Italian girls went to catechism, so that seemed like a good idea when I was 13, 14. And uh, so, yeah, I, I went there and sort of um, uh, got confirmed and, uh, and then have been sort of a, a off and on practicing Roman Catholic ever since, I guess. Yeah. Right. And so did you struggle at all? It, like You've chosen the academic route. Yeah. And I think that that's something that right now we're in this really interesting time where I feel like people are struggling with the idea of religion, with the idea yeah. of going to church, the idea of um, organized belief systems, yet 
personally, I feel like、um, there's like a back door, and reconciliation is sort of becoming the back door. If people are serious about the topic, there are there are overlaps between. Um, indigenous belief systems and other belief systems, whether that's the flood story,、mm. whether there's the idea of grace, and we have salmon ceremonies. There's these、mm -hmm. kind of overlaps that exist between them. So, despite the fact that I've seen people wanting to burn down churches or、mm -hmm. um, kind of say, "Well, this is kind of the nail in the coffin for religion," it, they've seemed to have left a door open from from my perspective,、mm. and I think it leaves the space open for us to try and figure out what can we learn. From these ideas, what are the underpinnings that we can get out of it? And one of the ones that Sunny had raised that、uh, you had brought to his attention was this idea of、um, communion,、mm. of taking in、um, the body and blood of Christ,、uh, whereas we have a fire and we give food、mm. to it. Would you mind elaborating or or sharing perhaps your your perspectives on、um, these ideas? Yeah. Okay.、Um, yeah. So、uh, I mean. My sense of、uh, the value of religion, spirituality, and and faith、uh, is sort of twofold. One is it it、uh, it's a way to constantly remind us that we're not ourselves as human beings, like、uh, the center of the universe. That there's there's something big, mystical out there, complicated.、Um, science is one way to get at that. I'm a firm believer in science. I I'm all vaccinated. You know that kind of thing.、Um, but there there are questions that Science hasn't answered,、um, maybe isn't trying to answer because it's not it's not the right questions, right?、Uh, bigger truths, right? In some ways,、um, why are sunsets beautiful? There's no evolutionary reason for a sunset to be perceived as beautiful, right? There's something about that idea of beauty. We have, you can say, oh, physical attraction between men and women, or or whatever, is a so serves a biological purpose, right? But but. You know what's a beautiful sunset? What? Why is? Why do we find that beautiful?、Uh, why do we like to stare up at the stars at night?、Um, so I don't think there's an old man who's God who sits up in the clouds, and and I don't、uh, think the Bible is a literal text or anything like that.、Um, you know,、uh, and this is just me, my personal faith kind of journey. But but uh, uh, being spiritual, being religious, is a way to I think keep me humble in some ways.、Um, you know, that that decenter that that sort of.、Um, Human, human focused sort of sense of the world. The world is made for humans. The world is all about me. I'm only alive now. Take what I can get now. You know that kind of thing. There are other ways to do that. Some people found other ways to do it. I'm not saying that's the only way.、Um, but then for me too, the other part, and this is probably where I, Sunny and I probably are pretty simpatico. Is、uh, you know I think back. You know my mom was Catholic. She came back to the Catholic faith after as, as a as a young woman when she was teaching in.、Um, My mom taught in what were sort of day schools. They weren't just indigenous day schools, but they were day schools, mostly indigenous children, but also white kids who lived in the area. So Port Hardy, Williams Lake, or Port Hardy,、uh, White Horse, Grand Prairie, Kamloops, and places.、Um, and that's when she sort of went back to Catholic and found out that her mom had been Catholic until、uh, things had changed. And、um, and so I've got ancestors who go back and back and back who are Catholic or who are Christian for you know, centuries.、Um, and you know, I don't. I, th I think they were、uh, smart enough to be getting something out of it. They weren't simply being Catholic because、um, an oppressive political or economic or religious system said you must be Catholic, you must be Christian, go to church on Sundays, believe these things.、Uh, there's some of that I think going on, but they found some value in it. I think, and so、um, I I'd like to connect. What what is it that they found the value in? What is it that, that provided them comfort during times of stress?、Um, What is it about the faith that would give them something to hold on to? Why why would they pass it on to their children? Why was it important for them to be, you know, part of that community? So,、um, you know, and I think the、uh, the Catholics when the first Oblate missionaries arrived here, one of the things that the Stalo people liked about the Catholics,、um, uh, there's this, we could talk about that in some detail. There's a lot of things that were good and bad, you know, in terms of those early relationships were appealing and unappealing.、Um, But one of the things that really appealed to the Stalo people here was that、um, the Catholics burned incense.、Uh, they were burning it for communion of the saints, right? They'd burn the incense, and、uh, and that would rise up. And and then the, the Stalo had their own burning ceremonies where they would burn food and clothing、right. for their ancestors. That, that's a, a parallel there.、Um, so that that idea was a powerful one that 
that made them see similarities, right? Um, uh, so so th that for me is important. I, I feel a strong connection to my, um, my mother's father, my grandfather. Um, I, I never met him. He died in 1944, but I've always felt close to him somehow, even though I'd never met him. And, uh, you know, so to me, the, the faith, the communion of saints, the idea that there are uh, ancestors are still guiding us in some way is a, is a belief of mine. And, um, and, uh, and that is, there's some synchronicity there with, with the Coast Salish Stalo beliefs. I really appreciate that because I agree with you. I had at 13, 14 sort of, uh, said, uh, religion, organized religion in this way isn't going to work for me. Um, I was living in poverty uh, with a mother with a disability and their worldview just did not resonate with me in terms of like, mm. live your life in this way. And it's like, you should hang out with the people that I'm stuck hanging out with in downtown. Like you don't understand my circumstance. And it was, yeah. there was a disconnect there that made me sort of leave. Um, but my grandmother, uh, non-biological grandmother passed away about a year ago, just mm -hmm. a little over. And she was a devout uh, Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. She had practiced. She wanted her children to. They chose to not practice mm -hmm. anymore. Um, my mother has since stopped practicing. And it was my mindset with starting this was like, she's left a legacy, whether or not somebody wants to pick it up or not, whether or not somebody wants to create the space to understand what that was, she's mm. left something behind. And it would be easy for me to underestimate her belief system and go, there's no guy in the sky, there's, this doesn't align with science, those are all easy outs. Um, to get out of kind of grappling with the information within the book. Like if you're looking at it as a literal interpretation, you, that's one level of analysis. You can have a biological approach, a psychological approach. There's different ways to look at the information. Sure. Literal is just one level. Yeah. And I think that we miss out on so much if we decide, oh, it's not, if it's not literally true, then why do I need to know it? Yeah. Um, I think, I think it's a misreading. It's the same when I'm talking to Sonny and he's describing, uh, the bad rock and the medicine man and, uh, this person being turned to stone for not acting well. Do I need to believe that this person was actually turned to stone in order to understand that when you stop collaborating with people, when you stop sharing your gifts with the community, when you start thinking only about yourself, that you turned to stone in some way, well, nobody wants to work with you anymore. So you are stagnated in a sense and disconnected from the ability to grow um, over time. And so it was about, yeah, a year ago, maybe a little bit more, where I started trying to take the information more seriously and say, okay, what can I, if I, if there is something to learn, what is there to learn? Yeah. And that has been an interesting journey because as I said, the idea of giving thanks for your food at grace, um, saying a prayer is the same as like a salmon ceremony where people are um, bringing everyone from the community together, uh, taking a piece of salmon and distributing that to everybody and then sending the bones back to the water and saying a prayer there. It's done perhaps differently, but it's the same uh, I, it's the same concept. Uh, we have flood stories. And so I think that when we start to look, and I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, do you think we were looking for the differences? Because that's what I feel like I understand is the differences between indigenous belief systems and perhaps Christian belief systems. That's what's been, uh, from my education, grilled into me is that there was this other belief system that came in and wrecked all our belief systems. And perhaps on some level you can take that but I feel like we have not been looking for how were we similar where was the overlap why yeah. what were those initial days because it didn't initially start as a bad relationship from at least my understanding we had trade um, with Europeans things were going moderately well the reason that we have Métis people today is because there was such a good relationship there uh, that they actually worked together and so um I get nervous when we have this idea that there was one side and another side and we never kind of got along uh, mm -hmm. because it, perhaps it's a misreading or things mm -hmm. happened differently. Uh, so I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah I, I, I really believe that all of, uh, all societies are, are hybrid in some way. And I know a lot of people today are kind of rejecting that idea in some, some of the disciplines and scholarship saying, well, you're making it sound like I'm a car, I'm a hybrid car, I'm half electric, half half." petrol, you know, and, and, you know, I'm neither, I'm, but, but that's not, that, that is what a hybrid car is maybe, but that's not what hybridity is in terms of its uh, intellectual kind of origins. Hybridity says that we are constantly products of our relationships. Relationships can be 
um, open and respectful. Relationships can be oppressive. And, and you know, th th there's a huge range of what relationships are. They're not all healthy, happy relationships. Um, but every time we're in that relationship, we are changed by the relationship. Um, and so if you're a colonial power taking over a place and, and, and imposing your rules and your religion and your worldview on it, um, you're changing those people. But you're also being changed by that process. It may be not the same degree of change, but change is happening. So um, Britain is what it is in part because of the colonial uh, um, contacts that took place. I don't want to say contact. That makes it sound neutral, like it's not, it wasn't oppressive. The colonialism that took place in India and Britain and, uh, you know, Burma, um, that shaped Britain as well. They were being shaped by the process and their encounters with that. And I don't mean simply, oh, you can get good Indian food in downtown London now or something. It's um, the people are changed by that. Now, yeah. the British, now, the Indian people in the subcontinent might have been changed more or more visibly for that period of time because of the colonial relationship, but we're all changed. Um, and all of our identities, uh, every human identity is is built in a relationship, right? So um, you can only be uh, a, a Protestant if there are Catholics. Y you're protesting something, <laughs> right? You can, you can only be um, Canadian if there are non-Canadians, right? Um, you can only be a, a, a father if there are, are children, right? So each, each of those identities is built in a relationship. Every single identity that you can name for yourself makes sense in a, in, a, in a relationship. And you can project that and say, "Here's I'm a Catholic, here's what Catholic means. And then right away, someone else is gonna say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, I'm, I'm a Lutheran and I know what a Catholic is. And what you're saying is a pretty uh, polished, slick, not full, complete sense of what a Catholic is, right? So these relationships are all about pushing and pulling our identities. Um, so if I'm a, a university professor and I walk into my class and I say, I'm a professor. You can only be a professor if there are students. If there are no students, there's no such thing as a professor. So the students though, aren't powerless. Even though I give them grades, I assign the readings, they have to do all these things that I tell them to do. If I start to behave in ways that aren't professorial, um, that are improper from their perspective as students, I cease to be a full professor, it starts to eat away at me. So if I show up late for class, if I give uh, don't uh, uh, don't give grades back on assignments, or the grades I give back are are uh, seem really out of line with what the students' expectations are, if I make comments that are inappropriate in class or or wander way off topic in the class, I cease to be the instructor. I cease to I, I don't get to define that all by myself. Right. The students push back and say, No, 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 you're not a prof. Look at you, you're. Whatever, <laughs> right? And so that I think is what's happening early on. The uh, the uh, the oblate Catholic priests are coming in. They're the first missionaries to kind of permanently come into this part of the world. They're meeting with Stalo people. They're coming with preconceived ideas, a certain colonial lens that says, "Here's what I expect Indigenous people to be," and in some ways. That lens makes um, makes the indigenous people uh, in their eyes the, the the expectations are met because you you see what you want to see to a certain extent, but you also see things that you didn't expect and you acknowledge and recognize those changes, and the same is happening on the Stalo side. I mean, there was a, a, a highly influential prophet um, from the Teat tribe upriver um, just outside of uh, uh, Skowelk at Ruby Creek, and he this happened. The fur trade had already started. There were you know, British people down at Fort Langley, but this was still a completely stall of space, the whole lower mainland Fraser Valley, uh, lower Canyon. But, uh, but the, the, the prophet up there, Scabical was uh, his name. Uh, he, he had a vision. He went up on a mountain. He went for a spirit quest, a traditional, traditional coast sailish spirit quest. And instead he perceived a vision of uh, Catholicism and the coming of European culture broadly. Um, and he was profoundly influential to to Stalo people, and he pr project, projected what was going to happen in the future. A lot of it comes true. I mean, he, he, he could go to Fort Langley. He could see certain things too. It wasn't like it was out of the blue. Uh, but one of the things that he he said is that um, young women should have the right to also select their marriage partners. Uh, this isn't necessarily a European thing. This is because arranged marriages were the norm in the Coast Salish world, and it was a highly stratified uh, uh, society with elites and commoners and even slaves down below. And so this man's vision included the sense that women should get to pick who their, their partners are. Well, some of the elite, the elite men didn't like that because 
arranged marriages were all about securing access to resources and make, maintaining peaceful relationships between communities and all, all sorts of really good historic reasons for these diplomatic economic relationships. Um, but he was plugging into something, uh, agency for women, and sort of a sense that the stratification within that society wasn't embraced and accepted by everybody, right? Um, so when the, when the Catholic priests show up, when the settlers show up, you know, the stall are seeing things and they're not simply seeing, oh, let me read your catechism and, and understand what your religion is. Oh, which is like, I, I believe in the uh, communion of saints, but I don't believe in the assumption and I believe in, you know, whatever it might be. They're, they're watching and seeing the behaviors and the beliefs and saying, is this useful to us? Is this, is this somehow useful? And um, early on, um, a lot of Stalo people found it useful. Some didn't, right? Um, because, and they embraced it, but in, in embracing it, they also changed it. It made it their own, right? So I think today when people say indigenous people, you know, you need to decolonize and, and that means break free from Christianity. I can completely understand where that motivation, that sense comes from. And I, and I applaud people uh, who do that. I think everybody should find their own path, right? Whether they're spiritual or atheist or wh whatever it might be. Um, but I do, uh, I have talked to uh, people who say, well, you know, I'm, I'm Christian, I'm Catholic, you know, elders in the community or some younger people. And, uh, and it's important to me, that faith. And it was, in fact, the faith of my father and my grandmother and my great-grandmother and great-grandfather dating back to the 1860s. Um, so it's not, not, those aren't just introduced or imposed colonial ideas, right? They're, they're, people work these out. Like, people have agency. They think through it. They find things that are valuable and they accept or reject things, you know. Yeah, when you talk about how colonization impacts other cultures or the people kind of perpetrating it, it's interesting that you say that because I interviewed Geetanjali Gill, who is a global development studies professor, and she went to the London School of Economics, and she said that there is a deep feeling of like, we are not going to continue what we've done in the approach that we had because it didn't work. Like our mindset on how we were going, like how Europe thought it was going to kind of move out its sphere of influence sort of failed. Obviously, like there's remnants of it in other countries, but they were the, the London School of Economics mindset is like, let's go listen to them first, try and figure out what, where they want to take this and then support them in what they think wellness is. Because we have a definition of poverty and then we go in and we say, you're in poverty. And they're like, uh, it's according to who we we've lived like this for maybe 100 years, 200 years. Like this is our we're more concerned about this problem or that problem or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so she's talked about how the culture within Europe now or at least uh, like England and London is different than what it used to be. And so I, I find that really interesting. And then. Uh, how you kind of talk about how um, we negotiate these relationships I th and how you like view the relationships and how it kind of began is so different than I think our understanding is um, when I think of our understanding of the term decolonization or our how I've feel like I've been explained the relationship between indigenous people and uh, settlers has been very negative. It's been almost all negative. And of course, like there's no disputing Indian residential schools in the 60s scoop, but those initial days seemed like they were somewhat different. And I didn't even know that um, these relationships were based on um, like having your partner chosen for you. Could you elaborate on that? I, like why didn't, why I've taken several First Nations courses. I've done my best to stay in on these topics how did i not know about that is that not something that's commonly like huh. mentioned uh, you mean about the arranged marriages yeah and um yeah uh, well i mean it's a well-established uh part of the um the traditional culture uh the the ethnography here is that uh coast salish people um uh, we're a class-based society as opposed to a ranked-based society, which is farther north on the coast. There's a real difference. Um, Could you tell us about that difference? Yeah, sure. I'll, you, I'll try to do this. And, and, you know, the elders I spoke to in the early 90s when I first started uh, talking about this were really, really clear about all this. And uh, um, and and so have been, so were elders uh, earlier who spoke to anthropologists and others whose voices are recorded in either on recordings or in field notes and things like that. But um, the Coast Salish had a, a class-based society. There were a, a large elite. It's sort of an inversion of the European pyramid where you have a tiny elite with a huge peasantry at the bottom and a smaller middle class. It's sort of, imagine that upside down. You have a large elite, um, a smaller sort of common era uh, group, and then a smaller uh, slave group. 
And um, slave is in actual slave or yeah, yeah, full on chattel slavery. The, these people had no uh, back in the day. They didn't have um, uh, the ability to own property. They didn't have the ability to go on spirit quests. They they were you know th their life could be taken by their owner. They could be sold. Um, and this was pre colonization. Yeah, pre colonization. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, every Sonny will tell you about this. He he he's researched this a lot. Um, every society has, you know, things that you, you look back on and you say, "Yeah, that wasn't that was right," because you know societies change. Not always necessarily always getting better or something, but they change, and you look back, right? That's just a weird thing, though. With like right now, we're having these coloni these conversations about colonization and what took place. Um, we don't seem to want to talk about the wars that took place. Um, I've talked to Robert Jago, who's working on the Coast Salish um, Indigenous Project. I think I have that correct. Uh, mm -hmm. He's from Kwantlen. He's interested in looking at the wars that had taken place prior to colonization and there does not seem to be that we seem to like our indigenous people that were sort of the idea that we were just all together in community and and just peacefully sitting and then all of a sudden we were attacked like that seems like what yeah. my understanding has been so please continue i just it's interesting that these are true and like i agree that like all societies have their goods and their bad it just feels like i perhaps didn't know about yeah some aspects well, and, and I, I can understand why it doesn't get talked about a lot because um, indigenous communities have been hurt a lot by colonization. So, you know, to point out things in those societies that were perhaps seen would be deemed negative today uh, is sort of a, a, an extra slap in the face to people who have been horribly oppressed and colonized by outsiders who – and the amount of damage done to indigenous communities by the outsiders, the colonizers, the Hualitam, right, the hungry people, um, you know, is, is – is massive. Uh, so why go back and pick at a scab, uh, you know, internally? Um, uh, although there are times where this is important to talk about. Um, so, so, so in the past, the, uh, all of the Coast Salish communities, n no one tribe had all the food resources they needed all the time in their territory. Right, they they didn't. Um, they had stuff that was more available at certain seasons. Things that were more available. Um, in in, uh, in certain multi-year cycles, like salmon returning in, in four-year cycles. Um, and so there were always people who wanted stuff in your territory, and you always wanted stuff in other people's territory. So uh, you could go steal it, and some people did, and that was the beginnings of uh, raids and counter-raids and, and warfare, um, and that was going on. And, uh, and or you could find a sort of peaceful ways to provide access. So... Um, one of the key cultural traits among the Coast Salish elite was generosity. So, um, if if you <laughs> if someone came to your territory, showed up, and you said, "You're welcome. Come eat with us. Come feast with us," um, you know that that was showing that you were elite. That like the ability to be generous, to have enough resources to share, was was what it, the definition of a Siam, like the, the wealthy, the that you know your history. The word Smalath are worthy people. At Nabob from uh, Seabird Island, originally from Tsailis. Um one of the first elders I interviewed in 1992 said, you know, the uh, the word for smalath means um, well, worthy people. And when I asked her, what does worthy mean? She said, well, people who know their history. I said, oh, what do you mean by that? She says, well, they know where they're allowed to hunt, where they're allowed to fish, where they're allowed to gather, right? They know through their genealogy the places and the landscape that, that they have connections to. And then the word for stachum, that lower class people, um, was worthless people. And I asked her again, well, what does worthless mean? And she said, people who have lost or forgotten their history. They don't, they, they don't know where they can go hunting or fishing or pick things. So they're dependent upon others to kind of provide through largesse access to those sites, right? And then there's a squeeth, a smaller group at the bottom who are, who are slaves, people at the bottom who are slaves. And I heard the same definition from Rosaline George. The same definition was from uh, West Sam. Other elders all, Smalath, Stechum, Squeeth, right? And what it means, worthy. You know your history. You can access, you know where to go on the land. You know your fishing sites. You know how you got them. So uh, e each of these tribal communities would form alliances. The elite would show generosity to another tribe by saying, let's marry our children to each other so that uh, you can come and visit and you'll have a, a priority access to the resources in, in our territory. And I, in exchange, will have 
access my family uh, to the resources in your territory. So when those, um, you know, in the season when you can harvest shellfish down at Musqueam, um, that would be a great thing. We'll come down and visit you and we'll get to eat some of the shellfish. And in exchange, you come up here and uh, you visit, uh, you're married into, say, the Teat tribe. We've got a lot of mountain goats with wool, and that's really prized for for making blankets. You know, it's no mountains in Musqueam territory. So th that's a positive. So these two communities form these alliances so that you can exchange wealth, right? But there's always someone who's going to come along and say, Ah, we could do that, or I could just take it. I could steal it, right? And so you had these sort of um, uh, groups of young young men, typically, who would go out and, and raid and take things. And then the elite, the CMs, you know, men and women both would have to mitigate those crises by, you know, hosting a potlatch that would, you know, make amends and arranging a marriage and things like this. And of course, some young men and women from elite families said, "Yeah, but I kind of fell in love with so and so, <laughs> um, and I kind of want to marry them." You know, I, 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 you know, I want to live here. I don't want to relocate and live there or something like that, I guess. And uh, and so this prophet, skeptical, one of the things he was saying is that, yeah, young women should have the right to, to pick who their partners are. Yeah. And so was this before colonization? Like you said prophet, and that doesn't sound uh, perhaps indigenous? Yeah, there's a, a, a Halcomalian word for what it was. That's the right. prophet is the English uh, gloss uh, term. I'm actually blanking right now on the word for Celia, I think. Um, I'm not sure. On no that. problem. Um, but no, sometime in the 1830s, so after Fort Langley had been established, but before the gold rush, before the, the movement, right? But, you know, getting back to your earlier question about what is colonization, what is oppression, um, you know, the, the Hudson Bay Company came in and they adapted. They had to adapt, but they were also trying to exploit, <laughs> right? They were trying to get wealth. And uh, the way to get wealth was to extract as through indigenous labor, extract as many valuable resources as they could from the land and then export them at, at for a profit. So they tried to do that with furs. Uh, the Stalo didn't want to trade furs to any great extent, but they were happy to trade salmon. And so the, uh, after three years, Hudson Bay Company was going to close Fort Langley. It didn't, wasn't profitable. And uh, the chief trader there said, well, wait a minute, before you shut us down, I mean, we worked really hard. We built the Palisades. We built these buildings <laughs> before you send us all home. Um, the Stalo might not be bringing in a lot of beaver and marten pelts, but they, they bring in a lot of salmon and, and they, they could bring us more. And so Fort Langley got permission to retool and they became a salmon trade place. They exported salmon, they barreled salted uh, salmon and they sold it to Hawaii, uh, down to California later. Um, like it was a major exporter of salmon, but it was all procured by Stalo people and then sent overseas. In fact, you know, the if you're a Hudson Bay employee in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, the plum posting was Fort Oahu. They had a fort in Hawaii, right, where they resold Fraser River salmon. Wow. Yeah. So um, then suddenly, you know, that, but that's not settler colonialism. That's a different thing. The, 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 there was no plan to move huge numbers of people here. There was no plan to control indigenous take away indigenous self-governance and control that. There was no plan to uh, control and export, uh, control and exploit the land and, and the, the, the trees and the minerals on the land, right? It was, hey, could we motivate you to use your labor as indigenous people to bring us stuff, furs or fish, that we could then repurpose, send overseas and, and at a markup price and make profit from, right? And all that changes with the 1858 gold rush. Um, and so what you have in 1858 is suddenly 33,000 or so men, all men, right, move into the Fraser Valley, the upper Fraser Valley and the lower Fraser Canyon. And A, they're not looking to stay here either. They're not, so they're not settler colonists yet. These are uh, exploitation, conquest exploitation colonists. They're, they're, and that's a certain type of coloniz colonization. They move in, they want gold. Indigenous people are in the way. Um, they might want to. They might want to exploit indigenous labor. Like, hey, can you paddle our canoe up? Can you guide us to this place? Can you provide us with food while we're, you know, panning for gold? But it was secondary kind of thing, right? Indigenous people were in the way. In fact, they embarked on what one of the miners at the time called a war of extermination through the Fraser Canyon. And uh, so you have to remember that these miners are the same people who had ten years earlier been the California Gold Rush, and in California. They exterminated indigenous people. You go around Sacramento, the Sacramento River Valley, all of Central California, there are no indigenous people left because they were literally exterminated. And, uh, you know, there were, this is well documented down there. There's books on this and things you can read, peer reviewed, good work. Um, 
the indigenous people in California, uh, miners were, were being paid uh, by, by other miners, little, little communes of miners, little villages that were set up, eight, ten, twelve dollars a scalp to go kill indigenous people. You could make more money killing indigenous people than you could looking for gold in California. And those guys brought that same attitude. They were the same people who came up here into the Fraser Canyon and they wanted indigenous people out of the way. And a war breaks out in the canyon. And it's uh, the Nakatmuk leader uh, Spintlam and the Stalo leader Liquitum from Yale and from Lytton um, who go in and they negotiate peace treaties with the American miners, some of the more level-headed miners, and bring about sort of a peaceful resolution you know, uh, to, to, to this and say, hey, look, <laughs> you guys are here. We're, we're going to stop shooting at you, but you can't do this stuff to us. And, and they work this thing out. But the miners were like, yeah, fine, whatever, because we're only going to be here for a year or two, and, and then we're gone. We're moving on, right? So those miners, they exploit the land. They don't care about the indigenous rights to the land. Uh, they exploit indigenous women. They're indigenous young girls and women who are being raped. Um, you know, and, and the Stalo and the Catmulk are pushing back against this. And then that, and then those guys move on, right? They're, they're here from 1858, 59, 60. And then now suddenly the, the gold rush shifts up to the caribou. Like they're moving to the next place, to the next place, to the next place. And, uh, uh, and then in the wake comes the settlers. The, and, and this is what the British government then, this is where they shift from, you know, the earlier fur trade economy to the settler colonial economy. The British want permanent settlers. They want loyal British farmers in this area. And so to, to make that successful, you need to push the indigenous people off the land, move them onto small, isolated, marginal uh, Indian reserves, right? And, and open up the land. And that's settler colonialism. And settler colonialism is that special type of colonialism uh, where the people who arrive within a generation or two don't see themselves as conquering and colonizing a space, but rather see themselves as inheriting a space, right, from the previous generation of, of settler colonists. And they see indigenous people simply as in the way. They're a problem. You displace them. You push them out of the way. And conveniently, uh, uh, demographics for indigenous people at that time were declining. Uh, smallpox, tuberculosis, influenza, measles, all of these diseases, which indigenous people had no ancestral immunity to because they were introduced here. They, they, they all come from domestication of, of animals in Europe, Asia, and Africa. Uh, the people here domesticated the dog, but they didn't domesticate um, cattle geese, pigs, all those kind of things. So those diseases that, that mutate from those animals didn't exist here. So the indigenous population was declining rapidly through disease in the 19th century. And uh, shrewd and cruel uh, settler settlers who moved in, people like uh, Colonel Moody, who was a scumball, Moody, you know, Port Moody and that, that guy, yeah, he was a horrible guy. Um, Joseph Trutch, who took over after Moody, another horrible guy. They, so my understanding is Trutch was the one who downsized from... Uh, I want to get this right. Um, Governor, why can't I remember his name? James Douglas. James Douglas. Uh, so are you saying that it was Moody first or was Moody doing something else? Yeah, Moody is a, Moody, Moody's just a, a sleazeball land speculator with a massive ego. And uh, James Douglas is trying, James, James Douglas isn't a hero. I'm not saying he's a saint or anything like that, but you know, he spoke with indigenous people. He saw a future that included indigenous people. He, he thought they should become Western style farmers and ranchers. He thought they should become Christians, but he didn't see them not being here, right? And he thought they had a right to be here and they had a right to lands and resources. That's clear. And uh, so he, he starts to say, you've got to set aside Indian reserves, reserves for Indian people so that as these towns are being created and white white settlers are moving in, there has to be space set aside for indigenous people and not just their little village and potato patch and, and burial ground. He, he defined them as anticipatory reserves. Uh, that, that's been, a lot of historians of the past have not understood, they've just glossed over this really quickly. What, what he meant by anticipatory reserve, and this is absolutely crystal clear, is lands that would anticipate indigenous people's future needs. It's anticipatory in that sense. Some people said, oh, they're, they're anticipatory because they were built by or set aside by indigenous people who would put stakes in the ground in anticipation of them being assessed later to become real or not re real Indian reserves, right, by surveyors. That's not what Douglas meant. He meant to anticipate their needs. So if they weren't farming and if they weren't ranching yet, 
he thought they would have to. And for them to be successful, self-sufficient people in this rapidly changing world economy, they needed land set aside for them. So Colonel Moody, uh, who everybody calls him Colonel Moody, but he was Lieutenant Governor Moody. He was also Chief Commissioner of Lands and Works. And that's his real job, Chief Commissioner of Lands and Works. He is doing everything he can to insert caveats into James Douglas's directions and uh, instructions so that these reserves are not being made. They're actually being, he's ignoring, he's, he's not passing on the instructions to have these reserves created. When he does, he reduces them himself before they're actually laid out. Um, and, and then he's land speculating. I, I'm working on a project right now where we're documenting just how much land Colonel Moody owns. And at one point, if I'm, you know, I'm preliminary still, but it appears that he at one point owns three times as much land in the Fraser Valley Lower Mainland than all the Indian reserves combined when he goes out of the office because he's speculating. And it's illegal for him to speculate. He's told by James Douglas and other people, you cannot do this. So then he sets up shell companies. People go out and speculate in their name, but it's his money and his property, right? He's just a sleazeball. And uh, so he does that to keep the reserves as tiny as possible. So who is uh, the higher up? It sounds like um, Douglas was higher up. Douglas is the governor. Okay. Moody is the lieutenant governor, right? But he felt like he should be the governor. He didn't like Douglas. He was racist. Douglas's wife was indigenous. Douglas himself was part uh, African American, and he hated them, constantly stabbing them in the back and stuff like this about how they were, you know, not suited to be in charge. But he was also chief commissioner of land and works, which meant he was the one who controlled all the surveys that were taking place, right? And what he was doing was setting up surveys and having the royal engineers create roads and things that were all going to turn the properties that he was speculating into into really valuable properties that he could then flip and sell for profit, which he does. He makes gobs of money doing this, right? And it's all illegal. It's illegal. And Douglas tries to stop him. And then he tries to hide things with these shell companies. It's a, a sleazy thing. And then just before Douglas retires, because there's a lot of pressure, people don't, Moody and his friends don't want Douglas in charge anymore. He's, he's, keeps standing up for indigenous rights. He keeps talking to indigenous people. He keeps making promises to indigenous people. Um, and, and, you know, this guy, we got to get rid of him. And so they start pressuring uh, the colonial office back in London to get rid of Douglas. And there's a smear campaign against him. And finally, the colonial office says to Douglas, hey, it's about time you retired now, right? And, and, you know, you've done a good job, pat on the back, but you've got to move on. And so Douglas, his retirement is announced. And Stalo leaders all over, like, oh, my God, what's going to happen now? And they travel down to New Westminster to meet with Douglas. This is just a few months, literally, before before his office, his term in office ends. And they say, we don't have the reserves that we, were to- we were thought we were going to get. We don't have the reserves that you promised us. There are places where you visit us physically on the land, and you promised us land to be set aside for us. Uh, that hasn't happened yet, right? And Douglas was aware. He was always being sort of made more aware, like, oh, my God, even after I did this last month, you're still not doing it to Colonel Moody, right? Right. So Douglas then, in front of the Stalo leaders, calls out William McCall, a surveyor, and says right in front of them, I'm sending this man up to the Fraser Valley to mark out your reserves for you. You mark them out as you see fit. And then he tells McCall, and if they don't ask for enough land, anticipatory land, that's going to keep them economically viable, self-sufficient in the future, give them more land, right? They might not understand what ranching is in some of their communities because they may not have seen a ranch. They might not... You know, you know, if they don't understand that yet, give them the benefit of the doubt, give them bigger land. And so McCall sets out these large reserves in 1864, and it's literally the month that Douglas is retired. Like, like he's in the field as Douglas leaves office and, and Seymour comes in, and as Moody leaves and Joseph Tretch comes in. And so what happens is uh, those reserves are, are mapped out, they're large. Um, and then for three years, the uh, Joseph Trutch and, and Seymour and Birch and a few other of these sort of uh, colonial sleazeballs, they, they sit and they don't operationalize the reserves. They don't go back and confirm them. They don't give maps, individual maps to the indigenous people. They know where the stakes are on the ground because they walk the perimeters with uh, Sergeant McCall. Um, and then they decide, like, how do we get rid of these reserves? This is what um, um, Trutch and Birch and Seymour are trying to figure out. Because this is valuable land, and we're trying to trying to encourage settlers to come. And we were speculators. They're all these guys are all speculators. Trutch is a big land speculator. Can you say what a speculator is for people who might not know? Yeah, sure. So um, under the preemption laws at that time, you could come in and you could claim 160 acres, right? And then you had um, uh, I can't remember if it's three or four years now to to um, 
improve those lands. You had to uh, clear the land, start to plant crops on it. And if you did all that, you could get that land signed over to you as, as fee simple, right? And then you could actually acquire additional lands beside it. But you had to prove that you were going to be a good British settler who was going to turn this into you know, a, a, an agricultural colony. So what Trutch and Moody did, they're the ones who actually said where the surveyors went. They're the ones who mapped out where the townships would be built. So they knew all of this in advance. They're the ones in charge of that. What they would do is say, ah, we're going to create the town of hope. Okay, I'm going to go up first and I'm going to speculate. I'm going to claim land in my name, right? And then they would send in the surveyors and say, now a township's going to be built here. And then suddenly that land is worth Sky a lot of money, yeah. right? But they haven't had to pay anything for it because they're preempting it. So they haven't had, they've got four years to, to prove up, to make it valuable, right? To prove that, and then it would become theirs. But what they can do is say, hey, I've owned it for six months. Do you, John Doe, want to buy this from me, you know this is going to be worth a lot of money in a few years' time because it's already going skyrocket. So you you give me $100, you give me $200, and you can have this land. So they're using their insider knowledge to access and find lands, to create them in their own name, not having to pay anything for it because they can preempt it, which is illegal, and then flip it before there's any investigation into that process. Right. So uh, they're doing this. And so the reserves that Douglas promised to the Stalo leaders with Sergeant McCall physically present to hear them verbally and, and get the written instructions. Trutch and Birch, um, these guys simply disavow that process. They say these uh, these reserves never existed. That's their, At first they say, well, should we pay them for it? Should we compensate them and take the reserve away? Oh no, if we do that, these, you know, we're opening a, a Pandora's box. We have to compensate them for all these things we've been screwing them over for, right? So it's like, no, but just pretend it never happened. We'll say that McCall, he didn't know what his instructions were. He misunderstood James Douglas. These reserves were never meant to be marked out. And then they sent people out to unilaterally reduce those reserves. And they were reduced by 92%. So when that happens, is that illegal? Like when we look back in history and define what took place there, um, or do the people reading that give Trutch the benefit of the doubt? How do we, because these re reserves are still set up the way that they were like set up by Trutch. And so what recourse is being taken? What What's the analysis? Because I know that uh, one thing I heard, and maybe you can correct me, is that they had Stolo leaders come out and try and map out what their land was. And it was kind of tricky because they had all of them come out and then they all kind of circled similar areas. And then they're like, how are we supposed to figure out who owns? Owned which land. Um, I remember learning that, I think at Stolo Nation at one point, that they just had them kind of like draw out where your map is of where your land is. And there was overlap. And since there was overlap, they kind of went, well, how are we supposed to know? Uh, not not quite, no. Okay. No. Um, no, it didn't, didn't quite work that way. It was it, uh, Colonel Moody... Joseph Trutch, th these guys were so convinced that indigenous people were dying off because of the diseases that they could get away with scamming the system, making money, and then not having to worry about it because the indigenous people wouldn't be here in a, in a generation or two. They were so convinced the demographics were going in that direction. So so this is where they, they say, we're doing you a favor, right? Um, we're we're going to... Um, we're not giving you a lot of land because that would stop the economic progress of the province. We want that to go to, uh, you know, settlers moving in. Um, we're going to give you small little bits of land, though, uh, because you're fishermen. This is what Trutch and those guys said. You don't need big farmlands because you guys aren't farmers. Traditionally, you weren't farmers. I mean, they actually did modify the landscape. They had controlled burns. They did grow tubers and things through what would be considered agriculture today. But they didn't have Western-style market economy agriculture, right? So you don't need these big reserves. So would this avow that they ever existed? Pretend they never existed. Um, uh, sell it all off at a profit to other people. And you can keep these small little villages that are along the edge of the river because you're fisher people. That's your main thing. Remember you were selling all that fish to the Hudson Bay Company. Keep doing that. Good luck. Where you go, right? But then within 10 years of those reserves being created, they said, oh, uh, these, these indigenous fishermen are so efficient you know, not just the Stalo, but the ones out on the coast and everything. They're so efficient. They're, they're, you know, we can't compete with that as, as settlers come in who want to fish. 
And, uh, and so the, the technology is you start using uh, Western technology to, to gill net between boats out at the, in the mouth of the Fraser River. And then those nets get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you move further and further away from the river to catch the fish earlier and earlier and earlier. And then you move to seines, seine nets, and you're moving way away, right, as the technology changes. And the canneries are built, big industrial canneries in the eight, uh, 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s down at what's now Steveston and Richmond. And so indigenous people, they said, well, let's keep them as laborers. They can work for us to catch the fish and work for us to process the fish, but we don't want them up in the river catching fish and bring them down to us, which was far more ecologically sound. Uh, it, you could selectively take the fish. You could ensure enough got to the spawning grounds. Mm -hmm. We'll just ban the in-river fishery and we'll ban the Aboriginal right to a commercial fishery. And, uh, and so that way we control it. And so indigenous people suddenly found themselves, they lost their land. They couldn't become commercial farmers and ranchers. And now they lost the right to catch and sell fish for a profit. So they found themselves impoverished, right? This is just, but by 1884, they're impoverished people. Um, uh, their, their, their access to land off the reserve is being rigidly controlled by uh, emerging conservation laws, uh, by the, the growth of urban farm sprawl and, and things. They're no longer allowed to catch and sell fish. They're only allowed to have a food fishery. So you can eat enough to keep yourself from starving. You can catch it for yourself, but don't you try to sell a fish, right? That's illegal. Meanwhile, there's gigantic commercial interests who are catching and selling and processing fish down at, at Steveson. And then that same year, uh, 1884, 1886, so, so I'll do the chronology. The big reserves are mapped out here in 1864, right? After Moody had tried for so long to stall that process, finally Douglas says, go out, map out the reserves the way you want them. And if you don't want big enough land, I'm giving you even more uh, because the surveyor, McCall, knows it. He leaves. He retires from office. Douglas, his successor, uh, and Moody's successor, Trutch and Seymour, they reduce that. They, they, and so in 1869, 67, uh, all, all those reserves are reduced by 92%. And then the Stalo are struggling along, but they can still fish and sell fish commercially. And then in 1884, the government bans the, the potlatch and bans the commercial fishery, right? So suddenly the Stalo now are faced... They're living on reserve. All they can do is work as seasonal laborers for, um, uh, you know, farmers who need them. You know, they're, they're not in control. They're just seasonal laborers. They can't sell fish for a profit, but they can work for the cannery for peanuts right down there at the cannery and the profits all go to somebody else. And then the government bans the potlatch that same year. And what that does, it, it, people often think, oh, they banned the potlatch. They banned a cultural activity. Well, it's true. It was a cultural activity. But what it really was, was a system of self-governance. So the the potlatch is, is that place where, remember we talked earlier about the arranged marriages. So, uh, you know, you would say, I'm getting to be an old man now and my fishing site up in the canyon is super valuable. And it's important that the next generation has someone who's going to take care of that fishing spot, who's going to remember the obligations we have to relatives um, from other tribes who have access to that because we arranged all those intertribal marriages, right? So that they'll have that. And so I'm passing on my hereditary name to my nephew or my son or my grandson or whoever it might be for a fishing site, um, who then will inherit the obligation to care for that site, to recognize all the existing obligations that go with that site, right? Um, but when the government bans the potlatch, you can't do that in public anymore. Suddenly, you're not allowed to have those big gatherings. So you might say, geez, I'm getting old and I want to make sure that uh, the site gets taken care of and all the obligations in the past are carried on. So you, you tell your nephew when he visits you that I'm giving you my name. You take care of that site. But your other nephew from the other side of the family, he remembers you always patting him on the back and saying he was a great guy and he was a good fisherman. So he thinks, no, really, Grandpa wanted me to have that site, right? So suddenly now the families start fighting over who has the hereditary name and who controls that fishing site and who controls that Wapato site and who controls that cranberry bog. At the same time, they're, they're fighting amongst themselves because the potlatch has created this confusion within families. Settlers are preempting more and more land. So suddenly now that Wapato site, that cranberry bog is now in the middle of a farmer's field and he won't let you access it. And that uh, fishing site you had up in the Fraser Canyon that was so valuable, that was so important that you shared access to for people from downriver at the Matsqui community, at the Catesy community. Um, suddenly now the railroads come through there and they've had to build um, uh, railroad trestles and, and backfill. And so they've dug out and, and dumped a bunch of gravel and riprap into that bay and it's no longer a viable fishing site. 
So Stalo people are, are left in this situation where they become, for the first time, um, what they referred to back then as poor and destitute Indians who had been the living on government welfare handouts at that time. This all happens in just just a decade and a half, right? This all, wham, they're just nailed. Um, and then the anti-potlatch law also bans the winter dance, the Tamanawas dance, the Chinook jargon uh, name for the Smitla, the winter dance. And, uh, and so that means that their spirituality, uh, a big aspect of their spirituality becomes illegal, right? So they're looking, to, uh, there's Roman Catholic missionaries, there's a few Methodist missionaries here now. They have a spirituality. Um, it's endorsed by the, by the government. Um, they can see some value in it. They can see some sincerity in it. So they embrace aspects of the Christianity because parts of their own uh, spiritual uh, traditions have now been made illegal. Um, but they're, no one's sort of um, at that point, you know, colonizing them in a forceful way at that point to become Christians. At that point, the residential schools that were set up were set up uh, as um, without government funding. And so the uh, St. Mary's, for example, for the first few decades operated as a place for mostly orphans and illegitimate children, right? A lot of white men were coming in. They were having sexual relationships with stall women and then abandoning them. And then that girl would have a child with no father. There was no arranged marriage. The, the extended family was like, what's going on, right? Uh, we wanted you to marry so-and-so down there from that other community to forge our marriage alliances, to cement our intertribal relationships. And so that child would often get dropped off at St. Mary's where it would be raised by the nuns and the priests. And that was sort of what the residential school was mostly for the first few decades. With the additional uh, uh, that many of the elite families, those CMs, would send one or two of their children to St. Mary's to learn Western style reading and writing and numbers so they could bring that back as a skill that they could use in those communities as they right. dealt with colonial oppression, right? Yeah. But not whole families. It wasn't until later that the government passes laws that uh, make residential school mandatory and that the churches embrace that because it's a way to get money from the government and it's a way to, um, to uh, you know, uh, facilitate conversions, which they see as like the biggest, most important thing is for them, right? To be saved. It's not, it's not enough just to be similar, to have, you know, uh, a belief and respect in ancestral spirits, to have, you know, uh, respect for God, the creator. You have to be saved. You have to be baptized. You have to be a follower of Jesus Christ, right? And so the Protestants and the Catholics all want those kids to come to their schools because that fits their goal. Right. Um, and they so then embrace the idea uh, of being um, participants, ha happy participants in a process of cultural genocide that takes place at that time. Wow. Okay, going a little bit back to potlatches, because I just had uh, Dr. Da uh, Dara Kelly on. Uh, she works at uh, the business school, SFU, BD school, mm -hmm. um, and we talk about potlatches. And what I found interesting was it sounds like potlatches also act as a form of creating contracts because it was in front of so many different people that you kind of had verification, like the way today we have a witness sign a form, mm -hmm. we have everybody in the room so you can double check and say, oh, do you remember it happening this way? Mm -hmm. And you would have symbols of like bringing in a paddle and saying, I'm passing on to you my fishing spot. And then they can refer to the paddle to determine whether or not that was the case. Um, it was also, and this is where I get a little bit confused. It's also a form of like, uh, the more you gift is a sign of your social s stature. Um, if you give more, you're looked on as more wealthy. And that kind of goes back to your idea of like, if you're able to bring someone in for dinner, or if you're able to work with another community and gift something to them, that's a sign of your wealth. That seems to be something, um, I'm always looking for those opportunities where we can talk about um, I, I really don't know always what people mean when they say decolonization. It's one of those words that's used a lot. And then it's tough to figure out what people's intention with that word looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way I try and approach it is like, what can um, Western society, Canadian culture learn from indigenous culture that would be a value? Uh, the thing that we seem to be struggling with right now is this idea of uh, wealth inequality, um, income inequality. And so when I think of... Um, individuals being able to give to charity as a sign of like their wealth of their comfort it's that overlap but would you be able to explain um perhaps what the the potlatch acted as in terms of that um and also what was the government's logic in removing it did they know the significance of it um when they decided to ban it um did they have a plan in place like this is going to wreck them um and this is why what was the kind of mentality behind that 
Yeah, the, the, the main objection that the government and the missionaries had to the potlatch was that uh, rather than accumulating wealth in a capitalist way, that you could then leverage, you could then use it to get loans. I have I have all this wealth I've accumulated. Now I can borrow against it, get more wealth. Right? This is this is what the 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 priests and the government wanted Indigenous people to do. You have to be assimilated, right? And instead, they saw these uh, chiefs holding potlatches and giving away all their wealth, like like everything they had. And then other people became indebted. They became other people became indebted to them. And at the next potlatch, people would give them a whole bunch of wealth, would come back to them again. And, and so largesse and generosity were, were fundamental to the potlatch system, but it was pragmatic at the same time. You, uh, you, so, you know, the potlatch was all about transferring names across generations. And those names carried with them rights to places on the landscape, fishing sites, wapato sites, cranberry bogs, um, those kind of things. And, uh, and so you wanted as many people as possible to witness it. So they would all say, oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that's where, uh, you know, Bill gave his nephew that, that, that name. And with that name goes that, that resource site. So you wanted people to witness it. One way to show that you really were worthy of having the site in the first place was to show all the wealth because wealth comes from those sites, right? Food is wealth in those days. So by having a big potlatch and giving away a lot of wealth, canoes, paddles, blankets, dried salmon, um, you were showing that you were worthy of having that site and therefore legitimately could pass on the rights to it through that name to others. So, so it was, that was the, the system of governance and economics uh, tied together. And the government didn't like people giving away wealth. I mean, sometimes the, the Stala would say, we're so wealthy, you know, this family, we have such a great fishing site and we're giving away, we're passing this name on to our, our grandson. Um, we're so wealthy though at the end here, we still have more wealth. We've given away all this wealth to all these people visiting us. We still have more. So we're going to throw, here's a sewing machine, like literally a Singer sewing machine, toss it into the Fraser River. And here's another one, toss it into the Fraser River. We're so wealthy that we don't even need those, right? And the missionaries and government would see that and say, oh my God, they're throwing away modern technology. They're they're wasting wealth. They're they're throwing away money essentially, right? And for the Stalo people who are watching it, they'd say, "That's amazing. These people have already shared their food, their wealth. They provided access to this. We all see how legitimate they are, and they still had extra leftover wealth. That's how worthy they are. That's how noble they are, right?" right. So the, these gestures uh, were perceived differently by, by different people, and that becomes a, a rationale for colonizing. And the colonization is all about land and resources, right? Like, like um, indigenous people aren't colonized because of the color of their skin. It's not racism. Racism is a handmaiden to settler colonialism. Racism is a way to help legitimize and, 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 and uh, rationalize the colonization of people. But the indigenous people here could have been purple or white. Um, the, a, they would still have indigenous rights because they were here first, aboriginal rights under British common law. Um, uh, but the, the point was they were in the way. Right, they were a problem to the settler colonists who wanted the land and the resources, the forests, the the the, the meadows for farming, the the minerals, the trees. That's what the settlers wanted, and so you push the indigenous people out of the way. So if they have a potlatch system that controls and regulates the land <laughs> and resources, then that's a problem for the settlers. So you get rid of that, right? Uh, you take away their right to sell the fish. Let them eat enough so that they don't cost the taxpayers money so they can have their own food fishery, but don't let them have any commercial basis for anything below that, right? So th this whole process is about displacing people from the land, delegitimizing uh, their their culture, their economics, their spirituality in their own eyes, right? To, to make them all feel that that's inadequate, not compatible, not helping them in this contemporary changing, rapidly changing colonial world. And then to reintegrate them at the bottom uh, rung of the economic and social ladder in that society. So you, you create the myth that you're actually benevolent colonizers. You're going to create tuition free schools for all the indigenous people. And, uh, and, and those kids get taken away, put in residential schools. You're not even charging them tuition. Look how benevolent we are, right? And the goal of those residential schools is very, very clear. The goal is to take from the government's perspective, from settler society, because it's a, settler society elected democratic government the goal is to take young aboriginal rights and title holders and to turn them into just another economic uh, just another ethnic oh, let me say it again so the goal is to take young uh aboriginal rights and title holders and turn them into just another ethnic minority within canada that's the goal so they'll just be like the japanese or the chinese they'll just they'll be here right we'll 
they can do the the bottom jobs, the, the the labor jobs, the unskilled jobs. They won't have any real power or economics. There'll be racism to keep them in place, but they won't be blocking our access to land and resources. That's what the government settler colony idea was for residential schools. From the missionaries' perspective, residential schools were a way to get money for them because the government would fund, after 1893, the government funds residential schools. So every kid that they get into the school, they get federal money for, right? And then that gives them a way to then convert them to save their soul so they can then write back to the Pope and to the head of the Oblate Missions and back to the Methodist and the Anglican Church and say, we've saved this many souls. We are doing this work, which is at the, the, the core of the civilization of the world. And so... That process of uh, Christian conversion is tied uh, directly to the economic exploitation and displacement of indigenous people. And, and those two groups come together, don't necessarily have all parallel uh, motivations and interests, but they overlap enough that the two use each other. Um, and indigenous people get caught and squeezed in the middle and exploited. Yeah, that is where things get even darker. It sounds like uh, 1870s, 80s, 90s, it's getting bad. And then Indian residential schools come in and make things a whole heck of a lot worse. That's right. Um, I'm interested to know, because you talked about how Indian res or residential schools didn't just exist here. You've done research on where they exist, um, I believe, in Mexico as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested to know, when did things go really south? in these schools was it was it day one was it um i'm interested to know the kind of the the journey that they go through and what your thoughts are on uh the bad actors in this because yeah. that is something that's i think important for someone like yourself to help us square because that's where we're at right now it feels like for some this is the nail in the coffin for religion sure. uh, evidence that they these are despicable people uh, despicable viewpoints and these viewpoints have always and will always lead to terrible outcomes i had the opportunity to intru interview um Chief Andrew Victor, who uh, is also a pastor at a native Pentecostal church, mm -hmm. and um, he sees the value in these belief systems. And as you said, other people do as well. And I think that we can absolutely always say that there were terrible actors throughout history. Uh, whether or not they represent what they say they were like we even today we have people who say that they're religious they go to church on Sundays and then they don't live out the tenets of that belief system the rest of the six days so when we're talking about the schools and who was acting in these schools I'm hesitant to accuse the whole church or the whole belief system of being x just because these people were terrible like um you can say that perhaps um, Trutch was a terrible governmental leader. That doesn't mean all governmental leaders are Trutch. Um, and so I'm interested to know kind of how these Indian residential schools developed from your perspective and where did things go wrong? And does this, what are your perspectives on the religious element of this? Yeah. Okay. Big questions. Um, and, uh, and really emotionally charged questions. Uh, you know, um, people have been hurt by residential schools physically, emotionally, sexually. You know, it, these are just bad. Residential schools were bad. No indigenous people asked for residential schools. Some indigenous people did send their kids to residential school because they saw it as acquiring some necessary skills, uh, Western style skills that would be needed for the next generation. But nobody said, hey, set up a residential school, take our kids away. <laughs> right? Nobody did that. Um, indigenous people were looking for Western style education in a rapidly changing world. The ability to read and write English was an important skill to have to help protect your land, to help secure uh, labor contracts, to help ensure, you know, a whole bunch of things. So indigenous people were anxious about that. A lot of indigenous people uh, heard uh, the, the teachings of Christ and said, hey, wow, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor. The, these are some pretty cool teachings. We, we kind of can relate to this, right? Because we're kind of poor right now. Look what's happened to us, <laughs> right? Um, uh, you know, love your enemy. Geez, we've been having conflicts with those uh, Lequel Talk people uh, up the coast for so long. We've been, you know, there's been these raids back and forth and they've been violent and, and harmful. 
what, if we could love our enemy and they could love us, maybe this would be a, right? So these are kind of interesting ideas that a lot of indigenous people uh, accept or, or embrace. They have their own traditions that they're still using and embracing too. They're, they're looking for synergies. They're looking for things that say, oh, this this is something that might am- provides amplitude to amplifies uh, an aspect of our, our culture and religion that we want to really emphasize now because we can see value in it, right? Um, and we'll also hold on to our traditional teachings. So the residential schools, um, you know, the, the, the they're designed to, to take rights and title holders and turn them into an ethnic minority. That's that's what they're meant to do. And um and and it's a sellout by the churches who are like, hey, we can we can get kids away from their parents and we can convert them to our philosophy, our theology, without the interference of their parents for multiple months of the year. Um and then we can feel good that we've saved these souls. They're now converts to our our faith and we get money from it, right? We get paid tuition. We can encourage more young men and women to go into the priesthood and into the convent and and if you're protestant become reverends and, and ministers um you know, you know it's 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 a corrupt it was a corrupt thing and and who does it attract into those schools who's the who's the you know the young non-indigenous man uh who in you know 100 years ago 50 years ago says um, I want to devote my life uh, to a career where I'm working at low wages uh, at a remote uh, school with a whole bunch of young children where these children um, don't have any parental oversight. Um, uh, you know, who, So maybe that's attracting some people who are just kind, benevolent people. Let's just say maybe, right? I can imagine some other people who are being attracted to that, right? And, and that's not pretty, right? If you're a pedophile if you're like you know and pedophiles from my understanding and, and i'm not a psychologist but talking to psychologists these people <laughs> who have these warped sexualities will do long-term detailed planning to get access to little kids right it, it, it's not just oh circumstance here's a i mean maybe they do that too but these these are creeps right who yeah. who do long-term planning so yeah if you want if you if that's your inclination if you really want to sexually abuse children where better than to set yourself up and get a job at a residential school right right and that makes my stomach turn yeah. right and um and so and i'm not saying that every priest every nun every minister was a pedophile but if you were a pedophile that would be some place that you would be attracted to in terms of a place where you could get access to kids without their parents being around to protect them yeah yeah that is the, one of the darkest parts i think of this conversation and of um, indigenous people's history is the sense of vulnerability and i find it um, really interesting to see the disconnect between canadian culture and um, indigenous communities because if you watch even like a movie or you read the book uh, the indian horse you see the very the first 20 minutes of the movie is families trying to get their children up north away from danger and protect them the best they can and so when i hear people today go i had no idea it was this bad that there were children passing away it's like that's really unfortunate to hear because this was taking place not just over five years, 10 years, 20 years. This was this happened over like a hundred year span of mm-hmm. these abuses beginning and taking place and indigenous people knowing that this is not the place for my kid to be. This is not a safe, peaceful, high quality education. Like not many people were thinking that. No. And so having that disconnect, I think really strongly reflects the the cultural differences that take place on reserve versus off reserve. Um, I still see those today that there are um, certain etiquettes that are allowed on reserve that uh, don't fly in our court system. As a native court worker, I had the opportunity to kind of see those differences. And um, what was taking place though in Mexico? Was there some sort of overlap there? Yeah, no, the, um, so the the Spanish claimed uh, the entire Pacific coast from Mexico all the way to uh, the edge of Alaska. That the Spanish claimed that Vancouver Island, BC, Washington, Oregon, right? Uh, but that claim was challenged by the British. And uh, and that's what in 1792, the reason George Vancouver sailed out to the West Coast was to meet, sit down and negotiate with Quadra, the Spanish representative over whose land this was going to be, who had the right to colonize it, right? Never talked about who are the indigenous people. The Spanish, though, 
um, had a pretty sophisticated system of colonization that they'd worked out all through Central and South America. Um, and they realized that if they wanted to uh, convert people and have them become passive uh, under their colonization, the best way to do it would be to have indigenous leaders that they would work through. So the Spanish at Nootka Sound, uh, tr when they traveled around from Nootka, up at West Coast Vancouver Island, down into the Straits of Juan de Fuca, and then up into the Gulf of Georgia, the Salish Sea area, they picked up little kids, little boys, and, uh, and uh, little girls, and they took them back to Acapulco. And the idea was that they would be put in, well, not the idea, they were put into a residential school there and the uh, with the goal of them being raised uh, as Catholics who would then become religious figures themselves, like friars, priests, nuns, who would then come back and be at the forefront of the colonization of, of this area. Th that was the goal. So the very first people from what we now consider Western Canada to go to a residential school uh, were taken to a residential school in Acapulco. But after, so they were being collected, literally collected and brought down there. And I don't know how many, this is part of a research project I've been working on for a while and I haven't finished it yet. I got to get my act together and do that. Um, but it's an ongoing research project. But, uh, you know, you know, dozens, I would say, of young children were taken to Acapulco who were New Chalneth and, and Coast Salish. And then when Vancouver and Quadra finished their negotiation and the British, uh, uh, the, the Spanish uh, no longer claimed this part of the world, those, those kids were forgotten. They were abandoned down there. So what happened to them? I, I don't know. I'd like to find out. I'd like to, you know, uh, do any of them, are there any people down there who carry oral histories about having originally come from far north on the coast? Um, you know, I, I don't know what happened to them, but that was the first taking of children by Europeans, those those kids in that residential school uh, that were taken down to Acapulco and then abandoned because the, the British took over this part of the world. Wow. And you also um, wrote a bit about a woman who started her own school. Yeah, amazing. Um, yes. Yeah. Can you, I think that that's in this very dark part of the conversation, uh, sort of a light in it. So could you tell us about that? Sure, sure. So um, some indigenous people uh, embrace Christianity. And one of them was uh, Alexis from the Huxiam, the Chiam First Nation, uh, just uh, upriver from Chilliwack here um, by the Agassiz Bridge. And uh, he was just a remarkable man. Uh, uh, he, he saw the damage that was happening uh, uh, during the gold rush. A lot of uh, whiskey peddlers were coming in from the United States and selling alcohol to indigenous people, creating problems like just had never existed before, right? The, uh, you know, you introduce alcohol to a community that is being oppressed and they have no experience with alcohol. This is, this is a deadly, deadly thing. And so Ch uh, Chief Alexis worked with the Catholic priests to get rid of the whiskey peddlers from the Chiam community. Um, he was a very smart guy and influential man and charismatic. And so when the, the, the Oblate set up St. Mary's School, uh, down at St. Mary's and in, in, in those early years, he he sent his daughter down there. Now, uh, I was speaking to Denise Douglas recently because I didn't know the, the daughter's name. And um, Denise said that uh, the daughter was uh, Philomena, I believe was she said. So this girl uh, went down and, and spent a year or two, uh, learned to read and write English, learn Western numbers, arithmetic. And, and then she brought that back. Her father with her came back and she set up a school at Chiang. And this is the very first indigenous run indigenous school, like Western style school that I'm aware of anywhere in British Columbia, perhaps more broadly. Um, but, you know, did the, did the Oblates support this? Did they come and say, hey, great, way to go. We're going to help fund this. We're going to help provide you with textbooks and resources. I don't see any evidence that they did that, right? Did the uh, colonial government at the time say, hey, way to go. Uh, congratulations. We're going to provide you with uh, building materials to build the physical school with textbooks with no, nothing like that. They just strangled that out uh, through neglect and, 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 and bad, bad mouthing it. So the kids ended up, you know, continuing having to go to St. Mary's and later to Kokolitsa and then later to All Hallows, the Catholic, Methodist and Anglican schools that existed in Stalo territory. So, so this young woman, Philomena, I guess, um, Alexis was, uh, Remarkable. She was the first school teacher, indigenous school teacher here, and um, 
and by all accounts was just an absolutely remarkable woman who dedicated her her life to assisting uh, her community and uh, and also was a huge assistance to her father on the political sphere because in the following two decades uh, she would write the petitions that he he would organize other stall leaders to come to Chiam and they would send a petition to the government complaining about something or demanding something and it was this daughter Philomena who would write the petitions for them wow can you tell us about the um, the Indian residential schools that existed here in the Fraser Valley? Because I think that uh, part of us knows that this history has taken place, but for some, they don't realize how close to home, how just around the corner down the block yeah. these locations were. Sure. Um, so there were uh, three different denominations had residential schools uh, in the, in Stalo Tamuk, the territory of the Stalo people. Um, the first one was set up in uh, 1862 at what is now Mission. It was a mission and a residential school. So principally a mission, a place to try to convert adults, everybody kind of thing. And then a residential school um, that was originally uh, d down right on the waterfront. But when the uh, railroad was built in 1885, they moved it up to what is now Heritage Park, if you would mission. And then from there, it moved in 1960 over to a site adjacent to that, which is the there's still buildings and structures there for that. But that was the the, uh, the Catholic residential school run by the Oblates of Mary Immaculate uh, for the boys and run by the Sisters of St. Anne for the girls. And then here in Chilliwack, um, the Methodists established first a little day school called Kokolitsa, primarily serving the uh, Skalkail community, but also Squiala and Suwali. Those were the three communities that tended to have a lot of um, people who uh, affiliated with the Methodist Church. And then they built that into an industrial residential school um, in the 1890s when the federal government started funding residential schools. So it became pr profitable for Catholic, uh, Catholic and Protestants to, to expand their residential school system. So they built the uh, Cochlitsa Residential School. And then the Anglicans uh, built a residential school um, up at Yale, and it was called All Hallows. And uh, that one, I believe, was only for girls, though. And I believe it's also the only residential school, at least the only one I'm aware of, that was um, a uh, had indigenous girls and white settler girls. Um, so uh, some of the white British Anglican families, even from Victoria, sent their daughters to Yale to attend the school. But it wasn't... Uh, <laughs> at first, when I heard that, I thought, oh, maybe this was a place where the young girls from the two cultures could kind of get to know each other, become friends, become allies, get to respect each other. But it uh, sounds more like um, the young white girls were taught um, reading, writing, arithmetic, and uh, the young indigenous girls were taught a little bit of that, but mostly they cooked and cleaned and stuff for the young white girls. So, yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, so what was, when did things get bad in the Indian residential schools? Was that from the very beginning or do you think that it got worse and worse and worse over time? And then we started having news kind of tell us about what was taking place here. Yeah. What was that kind of uh, development? I, I mean, I think they're bad from the beginning in the sense that um, they, they were about the intent was yeah, terrible. To, yeah. to acculturate, to assimilate, to to take away people's belief systems, right? The um, you know the, Ang the the Catholics at St. Mary's uh, back in the uh, 1870s uh, would have an, an annual event at the end of the school year where they would take the kids on a field trip to a mountain that uh, they called Devil's Mountain because of the the Helcomalan words. It was a there was a, a bad spirit at Slalakum that lived on that on that mountain. So they would, and the, the, they knew the kids knew this. They knew that the mountain was forbidden by the kids' parents and fam extended families. So they would take the kids on a, a pic family picnic up onto that mountain itself and to, to say, like, hey, look, see, there, your parents' beliefs, you, you got here and you're not being hurt or injured, right? No, no bad things are happening to you. And then they would take the children's names. They would take a piece of paper and write the children's names on the paper and then cut the bark on a cedar tree, pull back the bark and tuck the paper into the tree so that their, their name was left in the cedar tree on Devil's Mountain. So if you think what, what that meant to those children or to their families, A, they're going to a place that they've been told to avoid by their parents. They have no choice in this. They're being taken there by the, the, the authorities from the school. When they get there, there's a sacred tree, their sacred tree, Chape, the cedar tree, which is the generous man who was always giving and then was transformed by Chels into 
Khape, the cedar tree. You probably heard that legend before at Shuhuyam. And then they would take that kid's name and write it on a piece of paper and tuck it into the tree so it stayed in on the mountain even after they left. I mean, that's a pretty emotionally <laughs> uh, scarring uh, uh, event for, for those children, I would imagine, right? And confusing event for them, having the, these authority figures tell them one thing and their parents and aunts and uncles telling them another thing. So Yeah, just like degrading like uh, the cross with like if you were to light that on fire or do yeah. something terrible to that, uh, people would have elicit some sort of sure. feeling of discomfort towards that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know all, all three of the uh, those Christian denominations all fought <laughs> with each other all through this area. Um, they 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 all both went around. All three of them uh, went around uh, telling people who had affiliated with them, who had converted to say Catholicism or to Methodism or to Anglicanism, that if their families or friends converted to one of the other denominations, that that was horrible. That was worse than anything. That that would they were going to go to hell, that terrible bad things would happen to Protestants if you were a Catholic, terrible things would happen to a Catholic if you were a Protestant. Um, so they went around smearing each other. I mean, the, all, all, the interesting thing, all, all of those denominations could tolerate people who remain traditionalists, but they couldn't tolerate someone converting to one of the other Christian denominations. That was just beyond the pale. And they would go out of their way to, to, to fight and badmouth the other denominations. So here's this faith a Christian faith tradition that's saying, love your enemy, <laughs> right? Love your neighbor. And they're just fighting and attacking each other and, and you know, uh, yeah, horrible stuff. And then setting up schools where they are taking away uh, people's languages and cultures and, and, and things, you know. And in their mind, they think they're doing it for the right reason. They, you know, they buy into, conveniently buy into the notion that Indigenous people are all going to disappear because of diseases, and Indigenous demographics were declining. So that was not an unreasonable assumption, but it certainly wasn't a, a certainty. And and you know, and if white people stopped spreading the diseases <laughs> and uh, and helping to uh, Indigenous people to better uh, understand these new diseases, so they could deal with them, that wouldn't have been the same problem, right? Um, but so they could conveniently tell themselves, we're actually saving the kids um, because they're, if they stayed traditional, they would all die within a generation or two. And we're helping them to uh, accommodate themselves to this new emerging economy. they will be cobblers, they will be home, you know, uh, chambermaids, they will be uh, farm laborers, all these people at the bottom of the, the kind of social ladder. And we're doing this without uh, charging their parents tuition. Look how kind we are. We're, we're doing this at the taxpayer's expense. Like, look how great Canada is, right? And uh, so, you know, they, they talked themselves into making this all seem like a wonderful, benevolent, kind thing that they were doing. Um, but it was all about moving Indigenous people off the land and getting them out of the way so that there would be no impediments to the settler colonial expansion on the land. Yeah, and it was really discouraging because you see that Hoklamelam is considered an endangered language. Uh, you see uh, sort of the developments today in what's going on in communities, and it seems like there is a subsection that's working to rebuild, revitalize, um, but a lot of the challenges that were created over these years still exist today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested to know what your experience has been to kind of learn about the beauties of both cultures. Um, like you talked about the the generous man being turned into a cedar tree. Mm. The idea that uh, Jesus, whether you believe he was a literal person or not, but that that person is like the ultimate role model, the role model of all role models, um, to set an example for other people on how to live a good life, not to judge, to follow the tenets of the belief system. Uh, and then the idea of the generous man, to me, that there are, there are beautiful overlaps between the two. Have you... Um, enjoyed learning about the two different worlds and being able to see through two different lenses, um, I guess, two different belief systems? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not indigenous. Um, I, I'm, I'm close with uh, a, a lot of Stalo people and families, and uh, I've learned a great deal from them about their culture and tradition, which helps give me insights into my own culture and tradition. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think there are parallels um, so if so if there if there is a god you know he he, he or she or they <laughs> are not going to just reveal themselves to one little people in you know 
in Israel, Palestine, right? Um, uh, and so everybody around the world is has been working for millennia to try to interpret the world, interpret the, the you know the the ontology and the epistemology of of what things are. And I think all cultures can provide insights. Um, uh, I, I think uh, you know we've in the nineteen in the twentieth century you know when in North America when Christianity becomes the suburban expectation right you know everybody goes to church on Sundays and they up until the fifties right this is what you do this is expected this is what it is to be a good middle class working class family this is how you show everybody that you're you're good but the um, people weren't necessarily reflecting on the theology or. Or, you know, they would go through the motions and they'd hear the, the basic stories and they would defer to the priests and the ministers and others to, you know, provide the interpretation. So uh, as, as the, the pressures, uh, the, as the benefits of being a member of those uh, church communities, those faith communities in the 1950s and 60s diminished, right? People quickly left because, you know, what, what's the getting out of it anyway? Just dis disrupts my weekend. It takes away time and the stories are, you know, pablum. They're, they're so simple to understand. Yeah, okay, be a good person, treat your neighbor nicely. And yet, you know, there's no, I live in a world where clearly capitalist exploitation and <laughs> racism and all these things are, are everywhere. Um, you can see exactly why people fall away from that and find it, uh, you know, take a cynical view of it and, and, and things. So, um, you know, I respect people who, you know, Jewish people, uh, Christian people, indigenous faith traditions who who think deeply and uh, try to connect deeply with who they are in, in this world in a, in, a, in a metaphysical sense that is around um, complicated questions and, and making tough decisions. It's not just, uh, you know, uh, there, there's some... I think some people have sort of um, in this world today have kind of taken a easy way out, quick, you know, um, you know, uh, fast food uh, faith and spirituality kind of thing. I just do my own thing. I'm I'm my own spiritual person kind of thing. Um, yeah, okay, that's fine. Uh, some people are just dogmatic followers of the Catholic Church or or something. Um, yeah, I, I like to sit down and have have long and sustained conversations with with people about. Not just their faith, but their, about them and their faith is a part of that that I, you know, can learn from and re respect. Yeah, I think you set an amazing example. Uh, having the opportunity to ask Sonny about you um, and about your work, uh, he could not have given um, a more positive <laughs> review of what it's been like to build a relationship with you, huh. uh, the work that you've been involved in, um, the long-term connections. And that's what was inspiring to me to want to sit down with you is because mm. To me, I see a lot of people picking those sides or saying that they're done with belief systems or, again, they do their own thing, which is often they don't do anything. And it really feels like right now, I, I feel like we're lost as a, as a culture a little bit. And I've asked people like Scott Sheffield, who's done um, work on Indigenous people's involvement in World War II, and he's a military historian, on ideas like... Um, other cultures have like in uh, and I know they have a reason for this but other areas have like the draft still um, we in indigenous culture although it's not as uh, as much done is vision quests or spirit quests uh, these ideas that you develop yourself and you have to sit with your own thoughts uh, we have like uh, meditation, which seems like, uh, again, like the fast food version of really reflecting on what you believe and what your values are. And we have uh, the idea of being vegetarian and vegan. And while I support uh, the sentiments that are often behind those, which is I don't want anything to die for me to live, it seems like, again, um, Christian belief systems have grace as a way of coping with that responsibility. If you're going to take a life, you need to give thanks for it. You need to appreciate it. With indigenous communities, we have uh, ceremonies where we give thanks and we understand now that we've killed this salmon or this animal, we have a responsibility now to make sure that we are stewards for the environment and the ecosystem. And these are not obvious thoughts. These are things that you have to think about and wonder, how did we get there? Like, this is a really good idea. And it didn't just happen first day. It took time for people to develop these understandings. Um, 
I look forward to uh, talking to you in the future because I want to go through the Stolo uh, Kose La Chatlis, the book you wrote on um, building relationships and long sustained conversations because I think that this work needs to be highlighted and I hope that the idea of podcasting to oral traditions is something that Indigenous people take on more. I think that this medium creates the space for people on their drive, cleaning the house, to think about these topics and start to go, mm. well, what can I learn? And with the idea of reconciliation being so um, paramount in our culture right now, I think that individuals like yourself, individuals like Sunny, are the people we need to hear from. It's not just um, what I think. It's important to highlight individuals like yourself who understand, because uh, I look forward to talking to you in the future about, you've seen the history of what's taken place. Uh, you have a, a good understanding of like the governmental structures. So are are we moving in a in a right direction? And I think that these are when you see what's gone on with Tawasin First Nation um, and their their choice to develop, um, what you see, I think Stahelis just signed a, an agreement with uh, uh, BC and the federal government to get lands returned. Are these uh, in line with what's going on in other communities? Is this what looks good historically? Does this meet uh, kind of the dreams or expectations of individuals like uh, James Douglas? And I think that through that future conversation, I think we'll have a deeper understanding of where we can go in the future. But would you be able to tell people just for now um, what books you've written and where they can find those and then they can look forward to perhaps conversation too? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so um, if, uh, I've, so I've written or co-authored uh, quite a few things. If you if you want, if you have a children, like uh, Sonny and I co-authored a children's book back in, uh, in the day and it's called uh, I Am Stalo, Catherine Explores Her Heritage. Um, and so if you're t talking about a seven or eight year old child, that might be an excellent book. It's very, uh, I th it was really difficult to write because we were trying to take complicated ideas and, and package it uh, for a, a young audience. Um, uh, I, I wrote the book, uh, The Power of Place, The Problem of Time, um, uh, Aboriginal Identity and Historical Consciousness in the Cauldron of Colonialism, long title. Um, and that's basically a history of uh, of the, the Stalo people and their relationships with the Hualitam, the hungry people, uh, here from uh, smallpox, 1782, up until 1906, when the uh, delegation led by Joe Capilano um, goes to meet with King Edward, uh, and it sort of launches the pan-Indian modern indigenous rights movement that we see today. Um, I've authored or co-authored a lot of uh, articles and or chapters and books, and sometimes those can be a little bit more difficult to, to access. Um, uh, you can get all the citations on, I have a personal website, just keithorcarlson.com, and you can kind of get them there. I'm, I gotta figure out whether I'm allowed to actually just post PDF files there for people to, to download. I think probably I could, but in the past someone said I couldn't do that for copyright. I can't remember exactly how that works now, but I'll check into that. Um, but those are probably the... And then the Stolo Atlas as well, yeah. correct? Yes. Yeah, and the Stolo Atlas was a collaborative project. Um, uh, you know, myself and uh, um, Sonny McKelsey and Dave Sheppey and uh, a lot of the, the staff and uh, and community members in the Stolo worked on back in the uh, year 2000, 2001 when that came out. And it was, um, it was really... Uh, Different. There's nothing else at the time. There's nothing else like that in terms of an, an indigenous atlas that that wasn't just a matter of saying here's the past, right? Um, it's saying here's uh, here's our relationship with the land. Here's the process of our nation building in the sense of um, uh, building a, a nation today that is not just the Indian Act bands that are out there, um, but not necessarily the the pre pre-contact uh, extended family networks across tribal communities. It's like, here's what we're trying to do in this contemporary situation we find ourselves and our rela ongoing relationship to the land and resources uh, of this world. Um, yeah, so that was a real treat to work on that with those people. And uh, Kat Penyer, uh, Grand Chief Clarence Penyer, was our, our boss at the time. I worked in the Aboriginal Rights and Title Department, and uh, he gave us the thumbs up when we proposed that project. And so all, all credit goes to him for letting us carve out a little bit of our, our, our day each day over 18 months to kind of get that book pulled together. Yeah. Wow. 
I am so grateful to have had the opportunity to sit down with you. I I find you inspirational. I find Sunny inspirational <laughs> because uh, this is hard work. Um, a lot of it, I'm sure, is uh, sitting at a computer or sitting down with people, constantly returning, it sounds like, with elders to try and understand deeper, ask better questions. Um, again, Sunny has said that you are incredibly thoughtful mm-hmm. in the, the questions that you ask, so it's clear that it comes from an honest intent of learning and growing through understanding these topics more and sharing that with people mm-hmm. and that's really what this this podcast is all about is people have dedicated themselves to something and we should take the time to learn about it and so it is such a pleasure to sit down with individuals like yourself who have a deep understanding that aren't looking at notes they don't have to refer to things constantly in order to be able to talk about a topic it's you've integrated this into your understanding of the world and I think that we're just incredibly lucky and it's humbling to sit down with individuals like yourself who have worked to understand these issues and share your understanding. So I really appreciate you being willing to to share your time with us and uh, mm. share such important information. Well, thank you for inviting me, and uh, thank you to Sonny for all those kind words he said. He's a he's he's a wonderful man, my best friend. So yeah. Yes, there's lots to learn from both of these individuals. So please go grab your book, and uh, I guess look forward to uh, episode two. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Yes.